The company Solar States is teaming up with the Philadelphia School District to help prepare students for careers using solar energy. Solar States flipped the switch of the largest solar panel array in Philadelphia. Welcome back to another episode of Yo Sun. Welcome back to another episode of Yo Son. I'm your host, Micah Goldmark Chow, here with Jared Pashko. And today on the show, we have a longtime friend of Solar States, Jeff Heron with Green Tech Renewables. Welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm really, uh, very excited to be here. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for coming on, Just my guy. So I got to give a little bit of background here, you know. I think a lot of people who aren't in the solar industry, they don't realize the importance of relationships with vendors. And so I just got to tell a little story to start this off that when I was starting off in solar, um, I had no idea what I was doing. Got a contract for a solar system. Didn't I was oh, like, what, I what year is this? This is, uh, this is 2010. Like, yeah. 2010. Yeah. Let's call it around there no idea what i'm doing i'm like i got i got a residential project i gotta order all this material i don't know what material to get and i ended up um i can't remember the name of the company but it was out of arizona i was ordering from a distributor in arizona of all the places I, frankly there weren't many distributors around here and a gentleman by the name of boaz helped me out and he shipped me 30 parts that I didn't order. And thank God he did because I needed them all. <laughs> he knew better than I did what I would need to do this solar installation. And I remember after I completed it, I called Boaz up. I was like, man, thank you so much, man. You really saved my ass. That's like, you say, you know, you sent me all the stuff I needed. I didn't even know I needed it. Ordered and ordered from him. And then he got promoted and I had a new sales rep who knew not nearly as much about solar. And I had all sorts of trouble ordering the right gear for solar. And that's where I really realized that the vendor relationship is, is super important. Boaz, by the way, ended up becoming, I think, the CEO of a huge solar parts distributor at some point. Um, but that's just to show or to demonstrate how important a vendor relationship is knowing what parts are available, what you can get quickly. I mean, it's huge. I mean, Jeff, do you hear this from the people you work with? Like that you're, you're providing value because of the knowledge of equipment and things that you bring to the table. Not nearly often enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course. I mean, usually it's me trying to you know justify why I call so much uh, mm -hmm. versus my competition. So, well, it's because we know all this, you know, we're providing you guys with a lot of value here, but uh, that's what our job is. Our job is to know the regulations, know what's, what's the new equipment, um, you know, find out when you need that. And when, you know, Hey, you don't actually need this. Let's find you, you know, I have this on the shelf. That's, you know, it's a little older, but I'll make you a deal on it. Um, and it's going to work out perfectly fine. And, you know, working with these vendors and at the end of the day, I mean, you know, our job is essentially just to, I don't want to say to be the middleman, but we are right. providing the final mile logistics to your job sites, to your project sites, to your warehouse, or where, wherever it is. Um, and moving equipment is, it's a lot harder than people think it is. Um, back in the, you know, back in the day, I'm sure you can tell horror stories about, you know, when you had to have stuff shipped in 2000 plus miles for a job and you get onto mm -hmm. the site and you're taking the pallet apart and holy, holy smokes, there's two or three broken modules right in the middle of the stack. How'd that happen? Now your job is delayed two weeks. That all happens in shipping and, you know, having stuff local, being able to get it there quicker, it's less expensive in terms of freight damage and causes way less damages and way less headaches. So that's why over the past couple of years, you know, we've seen distribution just explode uh, in the solar industry. And yeah. I think we should take a step back for a second for some of our listeners and talk a little bit about what green tech does and a little bit about the solar industry supply chain. So great point, you know, on, on the customer facing side, doing residential solar, a lot of customers are out on the internet, searching tons of modules. And they're saying, what about this module? What about that module? And uh, it's a interesting conversation to say, well, um, I got to tell you about this wonderful relationship I have with Jeff and, uh, green tech and, you know, 
Green Tech's a distributor, got a whole bunch of warehouses here, stock, um, the best quality products, uh, good availability, good pricing, uh, able to get it to our job sites. And so, um, you know, that's a really good look for us. I'm sure, Jeff, you have a lot more to expand on about that. But, um, you know, when we go to a client, we're going with the list of offerings that you have. You have warehouses all across the country. Um, maybe you could share with the listeners a little bit about kind of what Green Tech does. Yeah. So, um, I mean, let's let's roll it back a little bit farther. So, uh, Green Tech is part of uh, Consolidated Electrical Distributors' is, uh, uh, renewables arm. So, CED has been around since the 50s, really just supplying electricians with, you know, conduits, switchgear, light bulbs, whatever they need for, you know, residential and light commercial uh, projects. Um, really around like the 2008 housing crisis, when all of a sudden no, everyone stopped building and doing renovations, we kind of thought to ourselves, how can we expand and how can we stay in business essentially? So, and at that same point, we had some of our contractors coming into our offices in like California and Arizona, especially saying, Hey, can you get me solar panels? And we're like, yeah, probably let's look into it. So it's pretty much how it started. It kind of grew out of the, out of the recession. Um, over the next you know couple of years, we expanded into new markets, uh, opened up new offices, or just turned you know struggling CEDs into green techs. Um, actually, the green tech name's a somewhat newer um, trademark. It used just to be CED uh, Green Tech, um, and we ended up. Um, I want to say I, I I was brought on board in 2015. I want to say I there was like 12 or 15 locations at that point. Since then, we have over a hundred. Um, our go-to-market wow. is essentially, yeah. I mean, what we're trying to do now is identify new markets to expand into. Um, and you know, like, if you go on our website and look at our locations, you'll see we have them all over the country. We have them in places that you don't really consider, you know, solar hotbeds, like you know, like um, like Montana and you know, Idaho and all kind and all all over the place. But if there's a population center, you know, they, with enough people there someone's going to be installing solar and they're going to need supply. So if we're going to open up a store, we, we can do that. And we have the ability to open up very small locations that may only have like four or five employees there. And, you know, we can do that and do it well. And it's still way more efficient, way faster and easier for our customers in this markets than, you know, by having a local store versus still drop shipping stuff in. Right. Right. And I think it's important maybe even to step back a step back even further, we're stepping Ooh, way. Back. We're stepping all the way back, aren't we? We're stepping all the way back. We're going back in time. No, I, I mean, I think it's important to just state you can't get a lot of the solar materials at Home Depot. Like this is stuff that if you don't have it from a reliable distributor, you, you're not going to buy it that day to finish the job. So, not having a part in stock could potentially you know, really screw you because you can't finish a job at a particular day or even in a week uh, if, if you have trouble getting that part. So I think it's important just to sort of reiterate that solar parts are still not sort of standard off the shelf stuff. So having distributors who have them locally, and I, and I think that the story that I gave to open this that, that said I had to order from Arizona because I couldn't find anything local um, to start with it is a big deal. It's a real big deal. Um, and you guys aren't just sort of, uh, you're not just middlemen. We care about you, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, but uh, I want to take a second here, and and uh, I don't know how to say this other than to say, let's lift up the kilt for a second and air some dirty laundry, perhaps. Um, you know, the service that you provide to vendors, like, uh, excuse me, to installers like us is that you, deliver materials, right? But we're constantly beating you up over pricing and availability and service and all of this stuff. How do you deal with that tension of like, okay, you know, I've got, I don't know, how many installers do you, do you work with? X number of installers and they all have different needs and wants and you've got to balance that all out with, hey, CED's got to be profitable. You know, green tech's got to be profitable here. So how do you deal with that tension? I mean, right now, what we're trying to do is 
is expand the offering. So we're talking about the, you know, the actual supply of material, but when you look further at what we've done over the past five, five to six years, like the more local, excuse me, the more recent um, time frame, we've really expanded what we're, what we're considering our services side of things where we're trying to bring much more added value to guys like you. So we have in-house design and engineering services where we are providing permit ready packages that you guys can essentially hand into your AHJs um, for your permit applications. We do this at an extremely competitive price where you're usually paying less than what you would with having somebody on staff doing it or hiring a local service. Um, and that includes wet stamping, um, Outside of that, our financial platform, we have gone to market with a lot of new products where it, you, essentially we're offering Wait, consumer. Can I, can I back up for a second? Can you sure. explain what wet stamping is to our listeners? It's essentially if you need a physical copy with an actual physical stamp on it, like uh, as opposed to a right. digital stamp. Some agents, not all of them, but some of them still require um, the actual physical paper to be handed in at a township, um, you know, center that way they can review it and approve it not everyone takes digital and what they call it they call it a wet stamp still because you're physically stamping it oh, with some good old wedding yeah table yeah. pound too. yeah i don't know if you guys that table. Table. <laughs> <laughs> this is but one that's of that's my soap like. boxes you know like <laughs> i can't stand that there's no uh you know universal protocol for submitting these permit packs that you know, could be adopted across lots of AHJs. It feels like every single one has different rules, different regulations, and they're so minuscule. It's just, it's, you, it's almost comical. You got to laugh. Right. Oh, you got to get four packets. It got to be in manila envelopes, not white envelopes. You got to address yeah. it to this person yeah. in this office. Oh man. Jared, yeah. I remember when the city of Philadelphia used to require that plans were handed in in black and white and I handed them in, handed them in in color ones, <laughs> and they rejected them because they were in freaking color. <laughs> oh, I wanted to like smash something that day. How yeah. dare you but, use yeah. a full color rainbow. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and for, again, for our listeners, AHJ is authority having jurisdiction. That's a, you know, an acronym, uh, for the folks who are accepting our permit applications, usually towns, municipalities, that sort of stuff. Um, for And they set the rules. I mean, they tell you what you have to turn in and everywhere is different. It, it is, it's a major um, frustration. But Jeff, back to sort of the, the relationship between installers um, and vendors. I know that you, or I should say, uh, Green Tech has an agreement with our solar cooperative that we're a member of, Amicus. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how that relationship started? And we love that. It mm -hmm. really helps us out a lot. Yeah, I actually don't know that much about it because we're just so layered um, here at CD, uh, or excuse me, here at Green Tech. Um, all I know is that there is a relationship there and um, any kind of special pricing that you get through there, um, they send it, they essentially share it through us um, that way you guys can use us as a, one of your preferred right. vendors. That's pretty much all I know about that program. Uh, well, that's, that sums it up. I mean, and that's, that's all I know about it too. I mean, <laughs> all I know is we get special pricing from green tech as a result of being part of a national, uh, solar cooperative named Amicus and green tech has negotiated with the national cooperative to give special pricing. So that incentivizes us to buy from green techs. And it's really, a, a virtuous cycle because it, it means we're incentivized to work with you and you're incentivized to work with us and everybody really makes out well on the deal. Um, now we, we recently changed our business model from being one of on-site delivery mm -hmm. to, uh, warehousing materials. Yes, Most, <laughs> I know. Right? Yeah. We hate sending yeah. our, you know, like a, a 26 foot truck down the streets of Philadelphia at 7 30 in the morning. That was, yeah, crazy. down some that alleyway crazy. down Addison Street. It's like this tiny alley, and you've got this yeah. huge delivery to make. I know you, we were driving you nuts with that. No, one. I mean, it was fine. That's what we, that's what we did. In fact, um, um, we, so when, when I first started, we had, we essentially just bought small trucks because, you know, that's what was, you know, it was easier, easier to navigate. And then as we got bigger and bigger and got, you know, built more business, we 
you know, got rid of the 14 foot trucks and got 20 footers and 26 footers and flatbeds, this, that, and the other. And we had, we actually kept our, we, we, we didn't retire um, our 14 footers on purpose because mm-hmm. you guys were taking so many, you know, you're taking three to five jobs a week in Philadelphia. <laughs> and it's like, do we really want to send this big ass truck down, you know, down, you know, these side streets? And the answer was no. So we kept, you know, we, we kept them on the uh, fleet roll for, for a while, but they, I That's think great. they, I think they've since retired. I think we might still have one of them left. Okay. We're, we kept your little trucks around. That's, that's a special, a special thing to me, the little guy. Um, so yeah, we, we switched to warehousing it and we saw, you know, obviously there's uh, more logistics on our end, less logistics on your end when you're, when you're just delivering to a warehouse. Um, would you say that most of your clients uh, are warehousing materials or are they getting delivered to site still it's it's still a good mix um it really it, it's still a big mix of of that kind of cycle it really depends on the customer themselves and what they want to do and even the ones who are taking where who are warehousing stuff they're typically not warehousing everything so we have a, a, a bunch of our guys who will take say you know racking and inverters to their warehouse and then they'll still have us drop ship mo- you know, send the modules the, the panels to to the to the job site just because moving moving panels around it you know it's not easy it kind of sucks yeah um you know especially if you're in the suburbs and you're doing you know 40 50 60 module uh projects that you want to move around two pallets three pallets of, pa- of panels and the back of your sprinters or a trailer no it's not it's not a, a fun time to do it i mean and even with uh some of your projects we still are taking modules to the job site when you guys have like larger, larger projects that you're working on. I think we just did one last week or the week before out to somewhere in Chester County. And it was a big grandma you guys were doing. Uh, I think we took like 85 uh, Q cells out there. Right. Um, And it was easier for you guys to just take it that way as opposed to, you know, lugging them up yourself. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real balance. How have you found um, finding employees for delivery and, and warehouse stock and all of that? Are you guys having any, um, I know for a while there, we had a real hard time finding good employees, but that seems to have uh, eased up now. And when I say good employees, I'm saying people who are coming through our training programs. We have a free training program. We barely had any signups um, for a little while there. Uh, it was a struggle. So did you see that same uh, issue? Yeah, hiring people is always, is always a challenge. Um, and hiring the right people is even harder. Um, we have new people start pretty consistently, but the ones who stick around are the ones who you want to stick around. And we've gotten a lot more, um, we, we, we've got a lot more selective with who we hire, you know, everything from, you know, from, from, from sales and management down to, you know, just guys who work in the warehouse every day, it's just because we don't want to have to keep going through the, the rigmarole of constantly vetting new employees, but it was a huge challenge for um, during COVID. It's definitely gotten a little, it got a little easier, but you know, thankfully the unemployment rate is still very low. Um, it's almost like uh, finding good people is a, excuse me, the the challenge of finding good employees is kind of a good thing because it just shows that the economy is still very strong, no matter what all the you know the the doomsayers, the talking heads say. Um, you know, just try to hire somebody and see and see who's actually applying. If you don't, ha- if you can't get talent, that means that no one, that people are happy where, where they are or they're not unemployed. Great point. Uh, great point. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. We've had a really interesting couple years in uh, particularly solar panel procurement and pricing. Uh, prices were, you know, pretty steady for a while. They were decreasing. Then they just skyrocketed COVID. There was a huge demand, not enough supply. Uh, Now it seems like there's a tremendous amount of supply. Prices are coming down. It's all over the internet. I get asked about it by customers daily. Uh, I've always loved your roadmap, your look ahead about what you're bringing into the distribution warehouses. Ultimately, that's what we're selling. Um, So I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, What does the future of solar look like in the next six months? Like, Where do you see the trends going? That is such a load of question, Jared. Um, We're here it, asking the hard hitting questions that customers yeah. want to know. Um, it's, it's really, really <laughs> tough to say. I mean, 
my gut says that we haven't seen the bottom yet at this market. Um, and then I think next year, so if you expand out like a year from now, we're probably going to see whiplash where the price goes back up. And a lot of this just has to do with the uh, with you know the anti circumvention tariffs um, and what the Department of Commerce is 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 doing. We're waiting on tariff rulings right now. Um, to give a little bit of color for anybody who doesn't quite understand what I'm talking about here. So, back in 2022, there was a essentially they reinstituted some old tariffs that they they expanded older tariffs on Chinese products to include um, a lot of brands, a lot of manufacturers who the Department of Commerce essentially said, essentially said were circumventing tariffs. Um, and they ex essentially expanded tariffs then on pretty much every major supplier of modules. Um, and then through executive order, um, Joe Biden essentially said, no, we're going to put a moratorium on these tariffs for two years to allow U.S. manufacturing to expand. That moratorium essentially expires in June, or essentially they have the ability to either ex um, continue the moratorium or just let it or just let it expire. And that decision needs to happen. I believe the date's June sixth, and then um, after June sixth, you have six months to essentially install anything that's still in the country that would be um, that would be found guilty of circumventing uh, tariffs. And I think what's going to happen is once June 6th comes, if there's not an extension on the tariff um, 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 moratorium, yeah. then we're going to probably see all these exposed um, products just dump in price. But then you have the challenge of if you're holding the bag still in these modules come December 6th, then you are essentially... Um, at risk of paying a, um, a a clawback tariff, a retroactive tariff of like two hundred of like two hundred and fifty four percent, and that's not the price that you bought of that. That's the price that it was imported at. And most of these products were imported in you know twenty twenty two twenty twenty three when prices were still high. So mm. you know if we imported something at you know uh, say sixty cents a watt, fifty cents a watt. Um, you know, that's 200 bucks for a 400 watt panel. Um, and then because of all this, you know, all the fear and it, it's an exposed product, you end up buying it, you know, let's say you buy a thousand of them for, you know, I don't know, 20 cents, you know, you got a great deal on them. That's awesome. Whatever you still have le left over, if you have any of those left over in your warehouse and the, they're not PTO, you're at risk of it. Now, how deep is the actual, um, you know, U.S. government going to dig? I have no idea, but we're talking about billions and billions of dollars of tariffs. I mean, they could hire a bunch of people just to investigate this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, yeah I want to clarify a little bit there. Um, I'm not an expert on this. I am just pretty much <laughs> what I hear in, um, you know, here for the grapevine, here in meetings and read on the Internet. I'm not sharing anything that's like private. This is all publicly available information. Um Mm -hmm. So go ahead and do your own research. If you're, if you know, you, you, you feel like reading boring government documents. And, <laughs> Don't we yeah. all? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, right. yeah, that, that, that's bathroom like literature. Just leave it. Tear, you know, tariff descriptions. I yeah. love reading that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike has been talking about the electrification of the lifestyle, like the whole house. Um, are you seeing a lot of people switch into electric heating, like other types of electric appliances? Is that something you guys are stocking or? We're not really dealing with the electrification side of things. Um, I do. We have some branches that um, that do sell things like smart home um, equipment. You know, they'll they'll stock right. like Nest thermostats or, you know, um, all the gizmos that go with that, for like home automation and that kind of stuff. I'm really into that kind of stuff. Um like I've got a bunch of home automation stuff in my house. I can control all my lights and uh, things on like automatic timers and stuff to do off my phone. Uh, I'm really into that, but we don't really stock it here. We haven't really found a, a need for it or a market for it just yet. Um, some people are really into it. Some people aren't. I mean, one of our, we had a customer a couple of years ago that um, they set themselves, what they were doing is when they, they essentially sold like an add on to their, their system where they would essentially install, you know, uh, 
a brand new smart ther- uh, thermostat in your house and then have like thermometers in the different bedrooms. They would replace your vents with these vents that communicated with your thermostat and then the temperature control. So they would know, Oh, this room isn't occupied. Let's close the vents in here. That way we don't, we're not pumping AC. Into That's this cool. Room. Yeah. I've, I have no idea how, how successful they were at selling that. They're not in business anymore. So probably not very successful at it. Yeah, but- I guess there's not a lot of outlets in, uh, in like AC duct vents. For plugging those uh those 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 electronic uh vent covers. Yeah, I have no idea how they they had a little bit of battery powered, and that's what happens when they all when the battery dies in the middle of the night and, and it closes, and all of a sudden you wake up and your room's ninety degrees. That's mm-hmm. fun. Mm-hmm. Well, a- as you know, Jeff, the the solar industry is littered with companies that have gone out of business. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. I I guess uh, a lot of industries maybe are like this. I don't know, but sheesh, when I think about my 15 years in the business and I look all around, there's, I don't think there's a single solar company in Philadelphia that was around 15 years ago. That's still around. I mean, it's kind of crazy. How do you deal as, as a distributor, somebody who's giving out lines of credit potentially to, uh installers with the fact that this is a dangerous game you know somebody could go out of business while they owe you a whole chunk of money i'm sure it's happened it has happened um we try to be really selective about who we you know who we work with um and who we're essentially offering credit to we will you know i mean it's, it, it's been a while since you applied for credit but essentially nowadays if you're a brand new company that's been yeah, it, it, like right now, I mean, if you're a brand new company, you've been in business for six months. I mean, we're going to need a personal guarantee. And even if you're not new, if you've been established, we still want to see financials. We still need to see your references. We need to see bank statements. Just make sure that you're profitable. We're going to look on Google and look up your reviews. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're essentially because we don't want to get burned because at the end of the day, we, there's no real recourse. If somebody goes out of business owing us, you know, a half million dollars, we don't really have a way to collect that. And no, all- there's no insurance that can be offered for something like that or anything. There is, there is payroll. And there, there, there is, um, you know, what we would call essentially AR insurance, but it's very expensive um, with mm. premiums and everything. And it's like, well, if you do this, you're, you know, you're, um, you're like deductible right. is, about half of what it is or whatever Mm -hmm. it is of whatever the loss is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we look at it and it's, it's, it's more finance. It's more fiscally responsible to choose our partners and partner with people Mm -hmm. who we think are going to, you know, do quality work and treat customers. Right. And if you look at the people who have gone out of business, um, you know, look up their, look up their customer reviews online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are not five star reviews. If someone's treating their customers bad, they're not going to be around long, and right. maybe we don't want to work with them. Right, right. Great point. I mean, dare I ask, what's the largest uh, ouch you've taken there? What, what do you think? Six I, figures. I'm not. I am not at liberty to discuss that. Oh man. Ah, oh, I was trying to squeeze I'll, Jeff for some. I'll talk to you about it when I'm not being recorded. That's outside. <laughs> <laughs> After the show's over, so, he'll tell us. It sounds like it was painful, man. Oh, goodness. We've had a couple of those painful Yeah, we, I, everybody has. If you've been in business, you've had Yeah, you're going to get burned. Gonna hit. You're going to yeah. get burned. It's such a hard part of this. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh, I did the work, and now they just disappeared. Oh, you know, if you're signing a contract for a solar installation, and let's just throw some numbers out there. Let's say it costs $20,000. Um, you know, you could fully expect that maybe anywhere from seven to ten thousand dollars of that is equipment. Um, and so my goodness, it's got to be paid for usually before you get the money from the client. Um, and that's where these lines of credit really make a big difference, uh, for installers such as ourselves and, and the financing programs that you're talking about, Jeff. I think it's innovative stuff and. Uh, the way that the industry is going to move is helping uh, smaller installers come up with good financial solutions for their clients. And it's sort of all facilitated at the uh, materials uh, distributor level. 
that's a that's a really innovative concept that I think green tech has brought to the market. Yeah, I mean, we're not and we're not um, out there and reinventing the wheel. I mean, if you've ever had somebody try to sell you, you know, if you ever need a new roof or windows for your house or whatever. I mean, I had a sump pump installed and they even offered me financing. Um, and I asked who the bank was. It was one who I was already working with for green tech, which was funny. But um, um, yeah, so like these guys, you know, who are these, the, these lenders, these call them construction lenders, they're in really every facet of it. Um, and then having a direct pay like that, it's, um, you know, it really helps a lot of people out, um, that way. And we've, we've, we've gone beyond just residential. So I'm involved in a lot of CNI projects, uh, commercial mm-hmm. and industrial, and we do this on the commercial side as, as well. We have a part, you know, the commercial stuff's a little bit more, nuanced um we have partners who we work with who offer these kind of uh consumer facing um payment solutions and then we also have um just straight up equipment financing that allows you guys to extend your terms out much much longer than what ced typically or what green tech typically offers mm-hmm. um and that way because we've all you know i'm sure you guys have seen it if you're working on a, a particular you know, like say a cash project and your milestones are spaced out so that you're not getting paid until, I don't know, this, that, the other's happening on the job site. And we deliver equipment. All of a sudden we get a week and a half of rain. Um, and you have a guy who, you know, then you have a half your crew calls out or something like that and your project's delayed. And all of a sudden the invoice is due, but you haven't gotten, you haven't hit that milestone. So you haven't gotten paid yet. Well, these, we have a program that essentially extends that out even longer by working with a third party bank and we eat the fees for the first half of them. And then any fees after, you know, after the first 60 days, you guys are on the hook for it if you want to extend it out past 60. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really good. Jeff, uh, I'm going to switch gears. Where, where are you from again? I was born in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, Trenton. Yeah, did not go to school there, thank God. Um, um, Trent makes the world takes, huh? Yeah, nowadays it's mostly drugs and not. And not <laughs> <laughs> That's rough, man. Um, <laughs> I, I'm joking. I, my my I, my mom and my uh, stepfather live in. They 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 still live in Trenton. Uh, okay. up in Trenton style pie, that mm-hmm. right? The Trenton style pizza pie. Yep, that's yeah. a specialty. I know. I mean, you'll get into an argument with some people who 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 will they will they will die saying that Trenton has better pizza than um, than than even like New York and oh, it's pretty damn good. You know, you you go play like the Trenton Hamilton area, you will get some awesome pizza up there. Okay, okay, food, yummy. Hold <laughs> on. So you grew up where? I grew up in Burlington County, Burlington like near like County. Gordon Town. Okay. So I got to give props to Jeff though. He's moved into the city of Philadelphia and Jeff is one of the most Philly dudes I know, man. He has really taken Philly as his hometown. And like, I love, I love hanging out with Jeff. We go to games occasionally together, although not often enough, Jeff, we should hit a Sixers game. Well, then the next time um, I, I have free tickets, I can't make it. I just won't text you then. That's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's the only get, time I get a call from it's you. It's your fault that it. you give him free tickets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, and, and you moved in the city and you've really embraced uh, Philadelphia. So I respect that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I grew up always being a fan of the city. I mean, as soon as I got my license, I was spending every other weekend here. Um, and I mean, you know, Grew up watching the Eagles and, you know, the Phillies and, you know, mm-hmm. really just dived into the sports scene here. And, it, you know, when I, you know, essentially moved out of my house and, you know, I was like, well, where I uh, applied to a bunch of schools. Temple said yes. So I was like, all right, cool. Let's go to Philly. Uh, and moved to Philly in 2008, uh, you know, got to watch the Phillies win the World Series that year, which was, uh, you know. Oh, man. Cool. Legendary. Yeah. Legendary. Yeah met my wife when I was in, uh, when I was in college, when I was a bartending, uh, downtown and, um, yeah, just never, never left. There you go. And so, uh, you're in the, the South Philly area. You mentioned the Trenton pizza pie. So let's, let's hear it, man. What are you, what are your favorite food spots to hit up? Oh man. What kind of food are you talking about here? I mean, let's I mean, it's, like, it's, it's, what do you want? Wrong you want question to... intentionally, man. You can, like you as a can vegetarian. Bring... Yeah. I'm a vegetarian. I know you're not, but you know <laughs> what about that there's that place in south philly that you love micah what's it called sicily three or oh little sicily uh little sicily two love yeah. that spot what happened love to that. to 
Little Sicily one. Is that not? I anymore? don't know. You know, where did Leonard That's part in one Sicily. through five go? It's <laughs> Leonard part six. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's just so, uh, it's, there. Yeah. it's in Sicily, right? <laughs> so I would say um, my. My favorite restaurant has got to be Bing Bing Dim Sum, uh, right on past Young Avenue. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Have you have you had had have you been there? You know, of I it? haven't been there. I don't know it. So I it's been, I've been there, but only for drinks, not for food. It's like a it's a really interesting fusion of like Jewish and like Chinese, and Whoa. they yeah, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, some of my favorite food in the entire in the entire city. Um, my wife and I, we ended up going to Barcelona right there. So we live near Pasco. Oh, Barcelona, I know. I like Barcelona. Yeah, yeah we yeah. live in Spanish tapas. Yep, yep. Yeah, we live, you know, about four or five blocks from there on the other side of Broad Street in Point Breeze. So, and our, our daughter's daycare is right there on Pasco Avenue. So, more often than not, on like a Friday, we'll pick her up and then go have an early dinner just somewhere on Pasco Avenue. Just there's so many awesome places to eat there, but. Mm -hmm. Um, there used to be a pasta place called Brigantessa that was so good down there. Do you did you ever go there? I don't think they're in business anymore, though. I don't think I did. I did see Ryan one day though over the summer. Uh, Ryan Kerr from your team. Um, mm -hmm. My wife and I are, are sitting outside at uh, the Dutch. Um, I think the it's Dutch. the Dutch and the Dutchman. Um, yeah, the Dutch. I've been there. Yeah, and we, you know, yeah. same thing. We just picked our daughter from daycare. We just go out there, have an early dinner and some drinks, and Ryan's walking by. Like, oh, Ryan. Hey, how you doing? You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, shout yeah, out to Ryan. Right. Really awesome podcast episode when we had Ryan on as a guest talking about his life growing up in Pennsylvania in yeah. kind of a dirty fossil fuel area and taking that heritage and bringing it to renewables. That yeah, was cool. yeah. And he's doing a great job with our with our warehouse. Um, and uh, hold on, I got to go back to a little Sicily too, though, because I got to <laughs> I got to tell about this. This is one of my favorite spots. That's at on Delaware Avenue. Uh, near i think it's right off of tasker where the wawa is and the there's South like a whole plaza. little shopping uh, yeah. mall there's a little plaza there yeah and there's this spot it looks like a pizza spot little sicily too you know but it's owned uh, I, I believe the owners are indian and uh so they have a whole indian menu in there and they also have some great pizza options like you know like off the wall alu gobi pizza you know it's oh, wow. but it's cool it, it works Somehow, and uh, I love to get uh, their veggie hoagie though. They're and they got sports hoagie. on the TVs too. I mean, it's and really they got sports on the TVs, and you think you're walking into this Italian pizza spot, and it's totally not that, and it's amazingly delicious. You know, and, I've ordered uh, from there before, I didn't remember what that place was called though. Um, that, that, that's that's funny. Yeah, that it's really me. good, it's really, really, really good. So, um, hold on, but the last thing is be careful there. Be careful because if they off, there's three levels of spice. There's like, you know, regular hot and then like Indian hot. And the <laughs> highest level is nuclear. It will blow your mouth. It <laughs> is unbelievable. It's so, not you just got to put yourself through the car wash after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you got to put yourself through the car wash after that. Exactly. Yeah. Just That's funny. Cool no, I mean, that reminds me like when I was growing up, I had a lot of friends who were all from Turkey and um, they all, you know, they all own diners and stuff. And, you know, it's, we all, you know, I think there was like three or four of the fathers, like they all had a bunch of diners that that they owned. And we'd go there and, you know, depending on who was working and be like, yo, can we get some kifta? You know, and they would, you know, like they, they, they'd have like, you know, like their, their secret Turkish menu that if you asked for it, they would, they would, they would just bring it out for you. Nice. Nice. Yeah. The off cool. menu menu. The yeah. Off menu. The off the off menu menu. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been another episode of Yo Son. I'm your host, Micah Goldmarkel, here with Jared Pashko. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Guys, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Peace. Peace.